Thank you, David. Okay, welcome back everyone. So this is the third and final um, day that I'll be talking to you. So uh, today we're going to start out by looking at some more of the data that we were looking at before, and then we're going to transition um, from looking at data, which is really empirical, and we're going to start talking more about probabilities, and we're going to then um, kind of transition to um, talking about what is Bayesian statistics and Bayesian ways of thinking about uh, thinking about things. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to share a link with you, and if you can't, uh, I'd like you to pull this link up. Uh, And actually today I'm gonna to show you a different type of notebook. Um, probably everyone is uh, familiar with Jupyter notebooks, um, but in, increasingly over the last year, I've been doing more and more of my work with a, a different type of uh, notebooks. So maybe it's also a, an interesting introduction for you of a different way of, of doing things. Um, and I'm gonna share my view of the notebook. Okay, so um, so th this thing, this type of notebook is something called uh, observable. Um, it's it looks a lot like a, a Jupyter notebook. Um, the main difference is that it's uh, it's not um, there's no kind of kernel process running on on your computer or at NERSC if you're using Jupyter Hub. Everything is actually running directly in your browser, and that means that it can't use Python at all because Python is not a language that the browser supports, but Python, but the browsers do have a different language that they support very well, which is a JavaScript. So um, if you want to use this, then you have to use JavaScript. But I'm not, I'm not gonna, this is not really gonna be a, a tutorial on, um, on Observable itself, but you know, just to let you know, this is actually something that I, in my own research, have been using more and more, um, mostly because it's, it's very easy to build um, more interactive, ways to, uh, to interact with your, your data and the analysis. And it's, it's, it's kind of a good way to do a more sort of interactive exploration of a, of a problem. Um, okay, but you're welcome uh, later on if you wanna ask me questions more um, about this. Um, okay, so what we have right now, so I call this data and probability lab, because we're starting with data, but we're now starting to look at our data in a different way. We're really focusing on the probabilities um, represented by our data. And um, but what do I mean by probability here? So there's, there's different uh, kind of different schools of thought about what is a valid probability. But um, right now, what we're doing is we're looking at what are called frequentist probabilities. And th those are not at all controversial. So a frequentist probability is you just count how many times something occurs and divide by the total sample size, and that is your frequentist probability. So if you want the, if you have a, a, a coin and you make 100 coin tosses and you get uh, 52 heads, then you'd say the frequentist probability of a, of a, a head was 52%. Okay, and that, that's something that everyone can agree on. We're going to get into more controversial territory soon when we talk, talk about Bayesian um, statistics. Okay, so, so what we see here is, uh, this is one of the three data sets that I uh, prepared for yesterday. This is the FIFA data set. Um, it's also, you can select the COVID data set or the Titanic data set. You can also just load your, uh, your own data set. It needs to be as a, in the format of a CSV file. So if you didn't have a CSV file originally, you'd need to go back to, um, to your Jupyter notebook and with, uh, in, in Pandas, whatever, you've loaded your notebook from some other format, and then you can just say to CSV and give it a CSV file name. So that will put it into a format that can be loaded here. CSV is convenient for working with, um, with files in this observable uh, framework. Okay, so once, once you've loaded the file, then um, this notebook uh, figures out what the different categorical uh, variables are in the file, um, and in fact, so, so, for example, one of them is a preferred foot, left or right, obviously. Another one is the league name. That's what's shown on the, uh, on the, the left side here. 
Um, I, to make this data set not too large, I just limited it to these uh, six, six leagues here. So the, you know, the, the top European leagues and the Mexican um, league MX. And, um, but there's also a lot of, in this data set, there's a lot of continuous variables. And uh, so in order to, you can always turn a continuous variable into a, a discrete or categorical variable by just binning it. Um, and you know, for binning, there's two different ways you can go. You can either just look, find the, the lowest point, the minimum and the maximum point, and you can just make an even, uh, an equal, equally spaced bins within that range. Um, that works well for some distributions, and it's often what we, what we do by default. But in general, if you have uh, some variables which really have a large dynamic range, or they might be quite clumped at low values with a long tail, either on the high side, or the low side. So a better kind of general purpose, uh, you know, fir first approximation is just to bin the um, the continuous variable in uh, in quantiles. So here, what I've done is just bin them in uh, in uh, twenty percent quantiles. So the first bin, th this this feature here is the uh, wage in in euros. Okay, so the, the the salary of the player in euros. And so the, the this um, first column are the players. Whose salary is in the zero to twentieth percentile, uh, compared relative to all the players in the sample, twentieth to 40, 40 to sixty, six to eighty, eighty to one hundred. Um, and so, so this is nice. Doing an odd number of bins is nice because then you get one. So the, the this one here is sort of the the, the has the median, which would be fiftieth percentile. So these are kind of the typical um, typical salaries. Okay, so you can uh, you know change any of these um, these change which features we're, we're getting, but let's just look at what, what we're, what we're uh, seeing here. So each, each row um, is, uh, shows you all the players in one league. So the top row is all the players in the English Premier League. Each column is all the players whose salary is in a particular bin. So this would be the, the, the 0 20th percentile salary bin here. And then uh, at, each cell of this table is telling us the, the probability. So it's basically just counting the total number of players that, that uh, are, so, that, so this one here that I'm highlighting 3%. So 3% of the players in this data set are in the French Ligue 1 and have a salary that's in the 60 to 80th percentile range. Okay, that's 3%. Okay, so the, for the name for this type of probability, because it's measured, um, it's really just counting the occurrence of something that's known as a frequentist probability. And uh, when we have a matrix like this, showing all many probabilities all at once, so these probabilities, if you add them all up, they add up to, uh, to 100%. So that, that's kind of the normalization here. Um, and so that's known as a joint probability. So this, this is a, a matrix of joint probabilities. At each row and column, we get the, the, the joint, the relative probability of being in a particular league and in a particular salary bracket. <clears throat> okay, so let's let's try let's use this now to ans uh, answer some questions. So, what is the joint probability of a player being in uh, uh, Liga MX and in the the zero to twenty percent salary bracket? So it's this it's this number right here. So the joint probability is six point four percent. Um, so. But more interesting is to kind of look at questions which you need to, where you need to look at more like a whole row or a column to, uh, to answer. So um, you tell me which league has the most players in the, uh, in the 80 to 100% bracket. So just looking at this visually, you just type your answer in the chat. Which league has the most players Yes, that, right. The English Premier League. So, um, and if you follow, uh, if you're following the Euros, it was nice to see England win yesterday. Since that's where I'm from. Um, okay. So, um, suppose. So, what we've done there is we basically just focused on one column here, and we're just looking at the relative size of these numbers in that column. Okay. So, and we're just we're just noticing that the the, the English one here is the uh, is the largest one. Okay, so that so that is a statement about uh, conditional probability. Okay, I'm going to define that more clearly in a minute. 
Um, but just when, when we ask a question that's kind of where we're restricting to one row or column, then we're talking about conditional probabilities. So we have joint probabilities, that's the numbers in each of these cells, and conditional probabilities are where we're focusing on a row or a column. So now let's ask another question. Um, suppose a player is in the Spanish uh, um, first division, the Primera, what is the most likely salary bracket for that player? Okay, so it's a players in the Primera division, what's their most likely salary bracket? Just type, type, type your answer um, in the chat. Right, so they're most likely, because this is slightly bigger, they're, they're not, not a, big, a lot of variation. The salaries are pretty flat um, across the, uh, it's not, it's, they're flat because it's in percentile. So that means that the, the fact that these are all pretty similar means the, the profile of the Spanish league is pretty typical to the profile of the whole population. Um, but most, most Spanish players are in this uh, kind of median 40 to 60 percent bracket. Okay, so if we look at the rows, we can see the English Premier League is really um, lopsided towards uh, players getting really high salaries. Um, the French and Spanish leagues are, are pretty even. Uh, fortunately, Mexico, so that, that's the league where probably the salaries are generally lowest compared to these, these uh, top European uh, leagues here. Okay, so um, so what I want you to do now is just uh, play, just change these different change the categories that are listed here. Just pick some pick some different categories, and then uh, um, just enter in the chat something interesting that you discover. Okay, so I want you just to kind of explore this data yourself, and just um, just find something that you think looks interesting that sticks out, and just type it in the chat. So just take a few minutes to do that. Don't be shy. So I'm just changing um, to different. So I'm changing my category up here to the preferred foot, whether the player is left footed or right footed. Um, and let's see here, I'm doing jersey numbers. So we're just looking at their, whether players have a low number or a high number on their jersey. Um, How good they are at shooting. This 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 is data coming from the uh, um, the FIFA twenty one database. Okay, Mexican Liga MX has the shortest players. Good, yeah, that's that's an interesting fact we can learn. Try try choosing one of the other the other data sets. So instead of FIFA, we can do uh, the COVID data set. So, but it's starting out just giving us the same thing here. So. Um, let's do vaccinations per hundred and um, gross domestic product. Okay, so we definitely see some some uh, structure here. So the um, the countries with the, the highest, um, in the highest court quintile of uh, gross domestic product are also in the highest quintile of, um, of vaccination. Um, yeah, okay, lose their point. Most players prefer to shoot with their, their right foot. Yeah, so that's, that's not too surprising, but it's nice to see. And you can actually quantify it by looking at the, the data this way. Okay, so, um, so now I want to talk a little bit more about, you know, dive into a little bit more some some definitions and terminology that we use in in probability to talk about different types of probability. So all the numbers here are uh, each each of the numbers here are what are called joint probabilities. 
Um, and I mentioned conditional probability, but I want to now just um, make that a little bit more formal. So I'm going to move to my iPad and um, write some notes. Okay, so what we were looking at before is we had basically a, a matrix of probabilities like this. So we have the, the numbers, um, we had uh, the area of each circle represented the different probabilities. Okay, so let, let's kind of move to a more abstract notation here. So suppose the thing that's being measured over here, we'll call that feature A, and it has different possible values, A1, A2, A3. And over here, we have feature B, B1, B2, B3. Okay, so the, the first thing we talked about, um, so we, we talked about the numbers, those red circles, the area of each red circle is a joint probability, and those sum to one. So if we just sum over ij, so p here just stands for the joint probability. Okay, so this thing here is known as a joint Okay, but it's what, what we found is it's it's often interesting to focus on just a single row or a, a single column. Um, one thing we can do is we can think about what is the probability of all the things in a single row or a single column. Um, and that is known as a marginal probability. So um, a marginal probability means that we're only, so if we just focus on that column, then we're just gonna ask what's the probability of, um, of, of just one, uh, we're basically summing over, there's, there's one thing which we're summing over, okay, so, um, let me define the marginal probabilities. So if we ask, what's, what is the probability of a player being in you know, Liga MX? Um, so this is really a definition. So it's just, we're summing over the other, um, the other feature. So we're taking everything that's in Liga MX, that's AI, and we're summing the, over the other the values of the other features, so the different wage um, quantiles, for example. So that's a definition of a, of a marginal probability. And that definition then implies that these marginal probabilities are also normalized, but in a different way. And we can also make a marginal probability in the other feature. Okay, and notice here we have th this one was always fixed. And now we're going to do, we're going to sum over all the values of the other feature A and keep this feature fixed. Now, somewhat confusingly in, um, in probability, in the standard notation of probability, we keep using the same symbol P over and over. Um, and, but it's, the, the reason that's misleading, it's not very precise notation because it's not the same thing each time, right? That has different number of arguments here. There's two arguments here. There's one argument, but, but in these case here, although they're both one argument, they're completely different functions because one's a function of feature A and the other one is a function of a, of feature B. So that's just, you know, unfortunately a confusing convention that people use in, uh, in probability. 
Okay, so those are known as marginal probabilities. Okay, and then finally, there's one more definition that's going to be useful, and that is what's known as a conditional probability. So the conditional probability, this, the, we're again using P, and we use this symbol here, the vertical bar, and, and the way you read that is that is that is given. So this is the probability of of A I given B J. And again, this, this is new notation, so there's a definition corresponding to this. So what it is is it's the the definition is it's the probability, the joint probability of A I and B J but then divided by the marginal probability of bj. Okay, so let's just look at that, go back to the, the, the picture here. So if we want the um, conditional probability of, let's say this one right here, oops. If we want this conditional probability what we're, do, what we're saying then is that conditional probability, so the numerator for that conditional probability is this right here, but the denominator, EBJ, is actually summing um, over all of the, uh, we're, we're keeping um, that value fixed, and uh, da, 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 PBJ, yeah, so we're summing over the A, so we're summing all three of these numbers here. So this thing here, which is known as a marginal, uh, sorry, conditional probability, then the conditional probability of this right here is equal to that number divided by the sum of these three numbers. Okay, so there we're making a statement about where we're restricting our attention to one column. Um, we could also restrict our attention to one row And so the vertical bar is the same thing. So the way we would read this is uh, the probability of bj given bi. And then the definition is essentially the same. We just flip. Um, we just flip ai and bj. Okay, but the, the numerator is already symmetric, so there's nothing to change there. But what changes is the denominator. Okay, so these, these are the two conditional probabilities. But what's the picture associated with that second conditional probability? So that second conditional probability looks like this. It's this number here divided by the sum of these. Okay, so those are going to be different in general, right? Because it's the same number in the numerator, but the denominator in one case is you're, you're adding all these three. And in the denominator, in the other case, you're adding these three. Okay, so the conditional, the, the probability of A given B is not the same as the probability of B given A. Okay, however, those two probabilities both involve this, this single joint probability right there. And the definitions, the numerator is the, uh, is the same in both cases. So let's, let's use that. Um, to derive an important result. So what we're doing is we're, we're noticing that the numerator here is the same. So let's write that numerator two different ways. So we can either write it as the conditional probability AI given EJ times EJ. So we're now we're, here. We're just I'm used to taking putting this over here to combine these two. But I could also combine these two like that, and that will then give me the condition the conditional probability B J given A I times the marginal probability P of A I. Okay, so I'm I'm really close to deriving something pretty. Uh, fundamental here, 
And that is, I'm just gonna take the left and the right hand sides. And then I'm going to just rearrange them to get a relationship for the conditional probability of B given I in terms of the conditional probability of A given B. So they're not equal just like that, but what are we missing? So we're missing, we need to take into account these two factors here, the two marginal probabilities. So we're, we're gonna have a ratio of those as well. Okay, so I want you to get a piece of uh, paper and just write this thing down on this piece of paper, on your piece of paper, just to have as a reference as we go forward. This thing here is known as Bayes' rule. And it's, it's pretty fundamental in statistics. It's also really, as we're gonna see, it, it is the, the basis of learning in machine learning. I mean, this is kind of the mathematical foundation of, of what it means to learn. This Bayes' rule. Okay, yeah, it's gonna give you a minute to, to write that down. Okay, so everything I've done so far is totally valid in the context of the so-called frequentist statistics. Um, Okay, so so you can just every, every, there's everything. There's nothing controversial about the the joint probabilities that are in these uh, tables that we got from the different data sets. And so Bayes' rule, although you know Bayesian statistics, there is some controversy associated with that, which we'll talk about. But it's important to to distinguish between Bayes' rule and Bayesian statistics, because Bayes' rule is entirely non-controversial. Non it just flows from the definitions of marginal probabilities and conditional probabilities and how they relate to joint probabilities. And by the way, if you're not um, familiar with those terms, joint probability, marginal, conditional, um, it's worth, you know, so sometimes when you're reading statistics papers, it just seems like there's so many different types of probabilities, but really it just boils down to those, um, those three things. And um, you know, the way you can recognize that something is a marginal probability is because there's some variable missing, right? Because if, if we just talk about the probability of A, and we know that there's also a B in our data, another feature B, so the fact that B is missing means that that must be marginal probability. So we say that B is being marginalized out. If we talk about the probability of B, then A must have been marginalized out. And for the conditional probabilities, you can always recognize those because they have that vertical bar, which, which we read as, a, as given. Um, it gets, sometimes it gets complicated because you can have hybrids. You can have something which is both marginal and conditional. So it'll have a bar, but it will also be missing some of the, the features. And uh, whenever all the features are listed with commas in between, then that's, that's uh, a joint probability. Um, any questions at this point before we, we move on? Okay. Okay, so remember this grid. So basically everything, all of the interesting statements we can make um, kind of boil down to uh, the numbers in this grid. And particularly we saw that it's interesting to make statements that are restricted to a row or a column, and now you've, you've seen that that's um, uh, really statements about conditional probability. And the important thing, so Bayes' rule basically says that um, if we want to focus on, for example, the highest earners, or in this case here, the, the, uh, the countries with the most um, uh, vac highest vaccination rate, and also the highest um, uh, GDP bracket, um, then we can either there's two different um, conditional probabilities. You can say, what's the probability of being in the highest vaccination rate given that you're in the, uh, the highest GDP bracket? Or you can say, what's the probability you're in the highest GDP bracket given that you're in the same, you're in the highest uh, vaccination bracket? And they're gonna be two different numbers, okay? But Bayes' rule tells you how to relate one to the other. And the, there's a ratio 
between those, which is basically the sum of these areas, the sum of these probabilities, and the sum of these probabilities. Okay, so in general, those two conditional probabilities are only going to be equal if these, the sum of these is equal to the sum of those. And that's generally not going to be true. Okay, so now we're going to go to another notebook. You can, uh, again, another observable notebook. You can open that up. Um, I'll paste the link here. Okay, so let me give you a problem. So now we're going to start talking about Bayesian reasoning, and we're, and we're going to see how it relates to the, the frequentist probabilities and the definitions that we looked at earlier. Okay, so here's someone that is uh, wearing a t-shirt that says England on it. Okay, so suppose you meet this person, um, you've never met them before, you meet them for the first time at your next conference, okay, which hopefully is not over Zoom, um, and they're wearing this shirt. So the question I'm ask, I want you to think about is what is the probability that this person is English? Okay, so just put your, you know, don't, don't overthink it, just put a guess in the chat. Okay, just imagine this scenario, you're at the, you're at a conference, you see this person never met them before, they're wearing this t-shirt, what's your, what's your best guess as the probability they're in English? I don't know, 60%. Okay, so we're, we're, we're pretty spread over, um, we're pretty spread, and that's totally fine. There's no right or wrong answer here. What I wanna focus on is not the right answer, but the right process. Okay, and that's what Bayesian reasoning um, is about. So um, the process is that we need to first define clearly, again, I'm kind of gonna walk you through uh, carefully how to, how to answer questions like this in a, in a Bayesian framework, and you'll see soon how it relates to those frequentist probabilities we were looking at before. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, so there, there's already some code in this uh, notebook that we imported um, up above. So first thing we need to do is we need to define our hypotheses. So we have two hypotheses here. And we could, I mean, and, and, and really, you know, I'm, again, I'm focusing on the process. So it's not really a right or wrong way, way of doing this, but I'm gonna say my two hypotheses are the person is English or they're not English. Okay, so the first thing I need to do, so once, once I've just determined what my hypotheses are that I'm gonna to use to try and explain the data, now I need to assign a probability to those two hypotheses. So what, what does that probability mean? So this is basically, the, the, of all of the participants at the conference, what, how likely, how, what fraction of them do I think are English? Okay, so nothing to do with the t-shirt. So I, I don't know, I mean, obviously it'll depend where the conference is and, and you know, different people can reasonably come up with quite, put in different numbers here. But you know, unless it's a, a conference on you know, English history at uh, Oxford University, then probably, they're not going to be most English, mostly English. So you know, let's say um, at a typical a Desi collaboration meeting, I would say it's probably going to be 20% might be English and 80% will not be English. Okay, so that's the first step in the, in the problem. And these are known as the priors. So they're, they're prior in the sense that we have to commit, write down these probabilities before we see, make any observations. So we have no data. So this, this is really our subjective um, uh, degree of belief of different, uh, for, for each of the hypotheses in the absence of any data. 
Okay, so next we need to specify what are the possible outcomes? What are the things, if I start to make some observations, what are the things that I can possibly observe? So um, I'm gonna keep this simple and just say there's basically two different observations I can make. Either they're wearing a t-shirt or they're not wearing a t-shirt. Okay, and for each of these possible outcomes, we need to specify, for each, we need to specify um, for each hypothesis how likely they are. Okay, so I'm gonna have to do the same thing for the, the not wearing case. Let me just line things up here so we can see it. Um, okay, so these are known as likelihood probabilities. So, and again, you know, you, we have to kind of come up with some, uh, some numbers here. Um, let's think about normalization. So the prior probabilities have to add to one. The likelihood probabilities so the likelihood probabilities, um, what we what the likelihood probabilities are normalized so over over the outcomes, not over the hypotheses. Prior prior probabilities are normalized over hypotheses. The likelihood probabilities are normalized over outcomes. Okay, so that they need to be normalized over outcomes for each hypothesis. So what that means is these two, these two numbers here need to sum to one. Okay, either the person is they're either if, if they are English, they're either wearing a t-shirt or not. So that has to sum to one. So here is where we put in our, you know, kind of our, uh, our assessment of the, the problem. So let's say that um, if, they, if they are English, then there's a 40% chance that they're wearing an England t-shirt, especially if uh, England just won at the Euros yesterday. Um, and if they're not English, then there's a 60% chance that they're not wearing uh, the t-shirt. Okay, so these have to add to 100. So I'm really just picking one number and then the other is, is one, one minus that probability if I just have two different um, possible outcomes. Okay, so, um, and now if they're not English, what's the probability that they're wearing an England t-shirt? Well, it's, I mean, certainly sometimes, uh, you know, people, Go, uh, go on holiday to London, they buy a t-shirt and they bring it home and they wear it. So it's not zero. So let's say there's a 10% chance that they're gonna wear an England t-shirt if they're not English. So that means this number has to be 0.9 because again, these two numbers have to sum to one. Okay, so now I've completely set up the, the, the uh, information in this problem. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a plot of the Okay, so this looks pretty familiar, right? This looks a lot like the plots that we had over here. We've got two different features, one one on the the rows, one on the uh, the, the columns. Oh yeah, so Sebastian asks, um, can we add a specific value for um, is German? Yeah, so, <laughs> um, so yeah, so I mean, just in general, if we want to elaborate the, uh, the model, so it's completely up to you how you set this. Uh, yeah, I know it was a joke, but it's a good question still. Um, it's, it's completely up to you how you want to set up the problem. So I, I'm choosing to only think about two possible hypotheses. So I'm basically just um, uh, kind of painting the world black and white, or black shirts and white shirts like the game yesterday. Um, and, uh, but you, you're, you know, you're free. What, I'm focusing here on the process. Okay, there, there is a correct process, but there aren't correct, um, you know, the details of how many hypotheses you have, how many outcomes you're gonna consider. That's all up to you. So I'm really just treating, doing this in the simplest possible way. So the likelihood probabilities, um, one over outcomes. 
Okay, so we get a, 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 a end up with a, a, a plot that looks very similar here. On the, the columns are the outcomes, either they're wearing a t-shirt or they're not wearing a t-shirt. The rows are the hypotheses, is English or not English? Okay, so although um, what we're, the visualization here looks very similar to we had, what we had before, okay, there is an important difference. Okay, and that is that um, in this case here, we were really, for the rows and the columns, if we, you know, here we're, we're just counting um, in the data set, the number of occurrences fall into that quantile for the row and that quantile for the column, column and then we just have a frequentist probability. Over here, although we can do that for the, um, the columns, because those are observed things, either the person is wearing it to the t-shirt or not wearing an England t-shirt. So we can assign frequentist probabilities for the sum of each column, but the rows, so these aren't things that we can assign any sort of frequentist probability for. These are not things that are directly observed. These are our hypotheses. Um, they're kind of the internals of our model. This is really our, our model. In, in, uh, in machine learning. So we, here we basically have a very simple model, which just has a single Boolean parameter. Either they are English or they're not English. So, so this is where um, uh, you know, a strict interpretation that you can, the only probabilities you're allowed to talk about come from just counting, so frequentist probabilities. So with that strict interpretation, it's fine to make this table of numbers, but you can't make this table of numbers because there's no, um, there's not really any kind of a procedure, counting procedure that allows you to assign probabilities to these things. Okay, we, we basically have to, um, uh, you know, the prior probabilities are, are necessarily subjective. And whereas the probabilities over in this matrix here are all objective, they really just come from counting and taking ratios. Okay, so in order to do Bayesian statistics, in order to really use this, uh, this process for, um, for learning, you have to uh, accept that some of your probabilities are subjective. And that, that's where you know, the, the, any controversy there is surrounding Bayesian reasoning is just whether the, the idea of a subjective probability is, um, is really valid or not. Okay, so how do we actually answer the original question? So we have to, uh, so this, this class has another method called learn. And what we do is we just tell it where the observation we've made. So the observation we've made is that they're wearing the t-shirt. Okay, so the thing I enter here just has to be one of the possible outcomes, wearing t-shirt or not wearing. Okay, so this is what we get. So this, we get a table with two rows. So the first row tells us before we've observed anything, so, you know, before we uh, get to the conference, this is kind of what we, our, our prior probability for people, for random people that we meet to be English or not English. So these are just the numbers that we put up here, the prior probabilities that add to one. And then once we observe they're wearing the t-shirt, that changes. And so now we think there's a 50% chance that they're English and a 50% chance that they're not English. Okay, so these things are for, add up to one. Um, if I look, scroll back through the chat, I see that no one really actually went for 50%. Oh, you know, Braulio did, okay. Um, but most of you either guessed pretty high or pretty low, okay. And that's, uh, you know, that, that's pretty typical is that your, your uh, instinct in these types of problems is, uh, is often quite different than what a, a careful um, analysis uh, will, will tell you. So, so where, does, where do these two numbers come from, the 0.5 and the 0.5? So the very first row, when we haven't made any observations, it's just these numbers. The second row, what we do, since the observation was wearing a t-shirt, then we need to look at the likelihoods associated with that outcome, which are 0.4 and 0.1. Notice these don't add up to, to one. So what we do is we, we take the prior probability, 0.2, and we multiply it by the 0.4. And then, and, and that's for is English. And then for not English, we take the prior probability 0.8 and we multiply it by the 0.1. So we get two numbers that don't add up to one, but then we just renormalize them. Okay, so that's exactly what's happening. So 0.2 times 
and then 0.8 times 0.1, you renormalize those, those are both 0 0.08. And when you renormalize, then you get 0.5 and 0.5. So that's why after observing the person wearing the English t-shirt, you're, you're now um, using this kind of Bayesian reasoning process. You're now, you think the probability is 50% that they are English. And of course, you know, that the numbers that are coming out here are entirely dependent on what I put in up here. Okay, and so, you know, in Bayesian reasoning, um, you know, different people can, can reasonably come up with different, uh, you know, put in different numbers here, and that's totally fine. What, um, what if they're wearing, they're not wearing the shirt tomorrow? Where I'm adding a second observation, the next day they're not wearing the shirt. Okay, so we can, we can iterate this learning procedure um, to incorporate not just one observation, but multiple observations. So the first day they're wearing the t-shirt and now we think they're 50% chance like they're English. The next day they're not wearing the t-shirt and now, our, now we're down to 40%. So where did that come from? So the 40%, it's, we use the same thing. So we just take um, not wearing, that the outcome is not wearing a t-shirt. So the likelihoods we're gonna multiply by are 0 0.6 and 0 0.9. Notice they don't add up to one. So we're gonna multiply 0 0.6 by what? Well, the first time we multiplied it by the prior, but now we've already, we already have some previous observations. So we multiply the 0.6, not by the 0.2, but by the number right above it, by the 0 0.4, 0 0.5. Okay, so the way you add new information is you take the likelihood for the outcome, not wearing the t-shirt, and you multiply those likelihoods by the, the probability of your most recent observation. Okay, so the prior is sort of like the initial, initial set of ops, your initial probabilities before you've seen any data. But once you start to see data, then you keep updating those numbers. Okay, so we just we multiply 0 0.5 by 0 0.6, and you multiply over here this 0 0.5 by 0 0.9. Those won't add up to one, but we, we renormalize and we get 0.4 and 0.6. What if they were wearing the England t-shirt the second day? Okay, so now we're even more confident that they are English 80%. And notice there's nothing sophisticated in our model, right? So maybe they only brought one t-shirt with them or their luggage got uh, is, uh, is, is stuck in the airport or something like that. Um, so we don't have any kind of sophistication like that, but you can build a model as sophisticated as you want. Okay, so, so what we're using here is we're, we're using uh, that, that Bayes rule. And in order to make the transition from these probabilities, which are entirely frequentist, to these probabilities where we have a mixture of frequentist, uh, sort of objective frequentist probabilities and subjective uh, probabilities assigned to uh, the hypotheses, things that you can't directly observe and, uh, and count. So we're still using the same Bayes rule, which is not, not controversial, but now we're using it for for more subjective probabilities. Any questions um, at this point? One message. Okay, so let me, I'm not, I mean, I'm just gonna paste in another example, um, a bit more topical. Um, Okay, so here I've set up a, um, the probabilities for uh, taking a COVID test. So what are my hypotheses? My hypotheses is that I'm infected or I'm not infected. So I need to assign prior probabilities to these. So let's say I live in a country where 2% of the population are infected, 98% are not infected. Okay, so those would be my prior probabilities. And I also need to specify the possible outcomes. So the outcomes of the test are either I get a positive test or I get a negative test. And for each outcome, I need to specify the likelihoods um, for each of the hypotheses. And the way these are normalized is that these two numbers here have to add up to one. If I'm infected, I either have to get a positive or a negative test. So those 95% and 5%. If I'm not infected, I either have to get a positive or negative test, so 2% and 
Okay, so, so what do these numbers mean? So this is saying that 2% of the population is infected. And this, this number is saying that um, if you are infected, then the test has a 95% chance of being positive. Okay, so the test is not perfect. Um, sometimes you'll, uh, that there, there's a 5% chance that even if you are infected, that you will get a negative test. Um, if you're not infected, then, um, then there's a 2% chance you'll get a positive test. Sometimes there are false positives, and there's a 98% chance that it'll give you the, the correct answer. Okay, so this looks like these numbers here. This is saying this is a, a pretty good test, right? Uh, for if you are infected, it's, it gets it right 95% of the time. If, if you aren't infected, it gets it right 98% of the time. So let's look at the, uh, the plot again. And now let's do the same type of reasoning. So um, I think most people's intuition looking at a, a problem like this is that if you get a positive test, then it means it's very likely that you have COVID. But in fact, with these numbers here, although the test appears to be very effective, with these numbers here, getting a positive test means that you're just a little bit less than 50% chance likely to be infected. So how, how is that possible? The test is so good, it's 95% accurate if you are infected, 98% accurate if you're not infected. It's because we have to, um, all of our probabilities uh, need to be in the context of a conditional probability, and we need to take into account the prior probability. And so because we're in a population, it's just intrinsically very unlikely that you're infected. Um, and that, that's why even getting a positive test with this very uh, accurate test still doesn't mean you're very likely to have, uh, to have COVID. So that's why um, players at the, at the Euros, if, they, get, if they, they keep getting tested every day, um, because if you get a second positive test, now you're 97% likely to be infected. Okay, so that's, you really need to have, with these numbers up here, you really need to have two tests. What if you got a, a second, your second test was a negative test. Okay, so that would say you have a very low probability. Okay, but you're still higher. Okay, 2% of the population are infected. And if you get a positive test, then a negative test. So now there's a 5% chance that you're, you're infected. So more than double the, the probability in the, in the general population. Okay, any questions um, at this point? Okay, so um, what I'm gonna do now is go back to the whiteboard. Okay, so here's Bayes' rule that we ended up with, just in terms of kind of generic uh, features A and B. So now let's uh, write Bayes' rule as it's generally used in, uh, in machine learning and just kind of in general in learning contexts. And you notice how it's the uh, Bayes is the, the S, the apostrophe comes after the S. I'm not really sure why that is, but I, I, that's what everyone says. So I think that's what it says on the Wikipedia page. My understanding of, of English is that it shouldn't, it would be here. But. So the Bayes rule for machine learning. So it's basically gonna be the same. I'm just plugging in for B and A something different. So let me write it out and then we'll talk through what the different 
pieces mean? Okay, so first let's just check this really is this something essentially the same. So over here, wherever we have bj, so now we have theta m. So bj, theta m, bj, theta m. Or wherever we have aj, now we have, uh, now we have d. Um, let me just underline everywhere we have m, because m is always basically a kind of a constant. It's always on the right-hand side. Um, and so often this is actually written without with the M completely eliminated, and then it would look more uh, more similar before. So the the association though is that um, the BJ has now become theta M, AJ has now become D. Okay, so what are the the uh, the pieces here? So D. is the data that we observe. So that it's just basically that uh, spreadsheet of um, observations in the rows and feature values in the, in the columns. Data M, these are the, the model parameters. And M are the model hyperparameters. And the reason we have a subscript um, here on the model parameters is because often when you change a hyperparameter, that actually changes the number and the, and the, the, the meaning of the, uh, of the parameters. So for example, um, we might have two different models. One is a single Gaussian fit and the other is a double Gaussian fit. Um, and the, the number of parameters for two Gaussians is a lot more than the number of parameters for, for one Gaussian. Okay, so you know, in, that, in that case here, we would have um, the single Gaussian, we just have you know, mu and sigma and the double Gaussian would have mu1, mu2, sigma1, sigma2, and then also some fraction telling you the, the proportions between the two, uh, the two Gaussians. Okay, so that's Bayes' rule for machine learning. And there's some important terminology that you've probably um, heard before. So you just give some names to the pieces of this uh, over here. So first piece, these are the prior probabilities. So we already met, we already saw those when we went through our Bayesian reasoning examples. So how do we read this? So this is the probability, the probability of the model parameters or the hypothesis um, given, given the, the model that we're working with. So that's the prior probabilities. And those were the numbers when we put in, when we said our hypotheses were uh, the person is English or they're not English and we assigned probabilities to that, we said 0.1 and 0.9, that, that, that's where those numbers go. Over here, this is the, the likelihood. These are the likelihood probabilities. And so that those were the other numbers that we put in. And how do we read this? This is the probability of the outcome or the data given the hypothesis. Okay, so we said, for example, in the uh, um, in the t-shirt example, um, we said that if they're wearing a t-shirt, then uh, 
for if, and they are in English to not have a, a 40% probability. So those, those, that's where those numbers go in right there. And then this thing on the in the denominator. So that is a marginal probability. It's marginal because the model, the, there's, there's no theta in there. There's no theta m. So that's how you know that it's a, a marginal probability. And the name for that particular marginal probability is it's usually known as the evidence. But it's basically the probability of the data um, summing over all possible um, hypotheses. So just referring back to the, uh, the table that we have up here. So now if we say that the, uh, if we now call it, this is theta m, and this, these are the different uh, observations in the data. So that evidence is just um, for, the, for the data that you actually observe, the evidence is just summing over this column. Okay, so you're summing over all the different possible hypotheses. Now, in general, the space of your, your model is not going to be just discrete. So we, the examples we looked at were really simple. We said either we just basically had a, a single Boolean um, parameter in our model, either they are English or they're not English. Um, in general, you're going to have many more. And if, they're, if, they're, if it's categorical or a dis somehow discrete, countable, then it'll be a sum. But more generally, you'll have continuously varying parameters, and then you're going to have to do an interval um, to calculate the, the, the marginalization. It's not going to just be a sum, but these sums uh, become integrals. Uh, so you will divide by the size of the interval? So could you repeat the question? So will you divide by the size of the interval? Would you divide by the size of the interval? Um, you, you divide by the, the, the integral, the value, the value of the, the integral. So let, let me, I mean, let, let me write, write it out more. Uh, So let me ask you right now. So the, the evidence the probability of the data um, given the, the hyperparameters, it's just it's the definition over all possible values for the model parameters. So not just your best guess. And it's basically, it's just a normalization. The, the, the denominator is just a normalization. So the thing that we're going to need to integrate is just all the, the numerator for all possible values of the, the model parameters. Uh, sorry, I got that wrong. So we're multiplying the, the integrand is the likelihood times the prior, but not just for a specific value of the parameters, but for all possible values of the, uh, of the parameters. So before what we were doing is we only had a, a discrete number of cases. So that integral was just a sum. We were summing over the, the we took a single column and we just summed over the cells in that column with a, with a discrete sum. But in the general case, you have a continuously varying parameters um, and, and theta will generally be multi-dimensional. So this is a multi-dimensional um, integral. Okay, so there's one last piece that we haven't uh, given a name to and that's this thing on the left. And that's generally the thing that we were interested in. So that thing is known as the posterior probability. Because fundamentally, what, what we wanna do, we wanna write a paper where we say that the, the probability of uh, omega m, um, we, we think that omega m is between 0.29 and 0.31 uh, uh, at 95% probability. Okay, so that is, that is a statement about posterior probability. 
It's the probability of something that we don't observe directly, omega m, given the data that we observe and given the model that we use, so lambda CDM uh, cosmology, for example. Okay, so, so fundamentally, when we're doing science, we really want to make statements about posterior probabilities. And so where do they come from? Bayes' rule tells you exactly um, how, to, how to derive those posterior probabilities. Okay, so I think you know, a helpful way of thinking about um, what's going on with, with Bayes' rule is with a, a, a little diagram and just kind of this really, for me, um, helps me remember how the, what, what the learning actually involves. So there's, there's two things that are contributing to Bayes' rule. So first of all, your prior knowledge. And so the prior knowledge is this piece here, the, the uh, probability of the parameters um, given, the, given the model that you're using, you have the hyperparameters. And then you also have some new information. So this is the data that you use observe. This is those million spectra that you collect from the DESI. And so the learning um, Bayes' rule is really telling you how do you combine those two things in an optimal way. And there really is just one optimal way to do it. It just, com it just comes from the, the, the axioms of, of probability. And that gives you your new knowledge. So the new information um, comes in. The new information is the data that you observe, what I, what I use the symbol D for. And the way that it gets combined numerically is through these likelihoods. Okay, so Bayes' rule says, how do you take these two mathematical objects, the prior knowledge represented by this probability, set of probabilities, and the new information, D, which we convert into probabilities using the likelihood, how do you take these two pieces and then get the new knowledge. So that's exactly what Bayes' rule is, uh, is telling you, okay? You're, you observe data, you convert that into likelihood probabilities, you combine that with prior probabilities, and then in order to get what we care about on the left-hand side, the posterior, you, you need to do this, this uh, normalization. So the normalization is gonna require you to calculate this denominator for all possible um, sets of the values of the parameters and sum those. So it, basically the denominator is just normalizing this thing in the, uh, in the numerator or you know, in the simple, coming back to the, you know, the table tabular example, the, 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 denom right, the, the numerator is you know, this, this joint probability right here and the denominator is the sum of these probabilities. Okay, so the new knowledge is then, is just the posterior. P of the parameters given the data and given the model that we're, uh, that we're assuming. David, there is a question of Maria uh, Pia about what happens if the model parameters are not Gaussian. Um, okay, so so we're really not assuming anything about that anything is is Gaussian here because you're allowed to. It's it's true that for the likelihood, um, for our likelihoods, we often use uh, Gaussians um, because. Because if, if this is really something observed, then the, where does the uncertainty come from in the observations? It comes from, uh, or, or you know, why is it probabilistic? It's because there is there is a measurement errors, and often to good approximation, me measurement errors boil down to Gaussians if you choose the right um, the right variables. But there's nothing here that requires that uh, that these be um, uh, 
that these these be Gaussians. You can you can use anything you want in this this probability. So it, it's it's very wide open. This is just a, a general framework. And certainly when the when we looked at the the examples um, of the T-shirt or the the COVID test, there were no Gaussians there. So so there's no there's no requirement for doing things with Gaussians. Um, but you know the two reasons why we often do use Gaussians. One is because it's it's often a good approximation because the the um, the reason we have probabilities and the likelihood comes from measurement errors, and those are often Gaussian. And the other is that Gaussians are mathematically so so convenient to uh, to work with. So sometimes we you know we cheat a little bit and we we just assume everything is Gaussian um, without much justification, just because it it allows us to uh, to simplify the problem enormously. Okay, so um, so I've kind of th this really th this diagram right here. This is the essence of of learning, right? You have some information that you started with, your your prior knowledge. You have new information, and you combine them. And there's really not there's there's no debate about the right way to combine them. There's just really um, one kind of optimal way to combine them, and that's what's given. By Bayes rule, okay, there's nothing. There's nothing controversial about the the mathematical statement here. It, it, it really just does boils down to the definition of, of the different types of uh, of probabilities. The only controversy is whether you're allowed to even talk about probabilities of um, of things that you don't observe directly. So probabilities of different hypotheses um, prior to your observation and then after your observation. So the prior and the posterior probabilities. So how, how do you do this in, in practice? Um, so the, the, the examples that we did explicitly in the, uh, the observable notebooks, so the, the, the COVID test and the, and the t-shirt, um, th those are very simple examples. And what makes them simple and what makes them practical is that there's not really any difficulty in evaluating the, um, the evidence here, the thing in the, in the denominator. And, um, but in real world problems, um, estimating that, uh, that evidence is actually extremely uh, numerically and computationally very difficult. And, and in fact, it's for all practical purposes, it's, it's essentially impossible. And so what that means is we, ne we need some practical ways to actually, uh, so in most interesting problems, The evidence is not is not calculable. So that means we need some practical techniques So the practical methods, what they do, the idea of a, of a practical method is to say um, so in general, in interesting problems, you are able to calculate, you can basically write a piece of code always that will evaluate the likelihood. So we have some Python function that given some parameters and within the framework of some model will calculate the likelihood of, uh, of different outcomes. And we also can assign prior probabilities to all of our hypotheses. So the things in the numerator are generally things even for you know, complex real world uh, inference. These are generally things that we know how to uh, evaluate. They, they might be expensive, um, but the thing is that we can't do this uh, denominator calculation, the evidence, which requires calculating the numerator for all possible values of the of the parameters, right? So, like if we're doing a cosmology inference, so our parameters we might have ten parameters: we have omega m, we have omega dark energy, we have w zero, w a, neutrino masses, um, and Calculating this evidence, even, even though for a given for for a fixed set of parameters we can calculate the likelihood, and we can assign priors to those parameters. So for a fixed set of parameters we can calculate this, but it's not practical to integrate over that full ten-dimensional parameter space to uh, to calculate the the normalization constant down here. So a practical method needs to take advantage of the fact that we know how to calculate this for specific fixed values of the parameters, but we can't practically 
do the, the uh, integration over here. And so the, the, the two methods then that are allow you to do um, uh, practical Bayesian cal calculations. So one is known as Markov chain Monte Carlo. So in Markov chain Monte Carlo, you basically write a piece of code that can calculate the numerator of Bayes' rule. And then it will generate, um, uh, so you have code for the likelihood plus prior. And then what comes out is a set, is, is basically a, what looks like a data set, except the, instead of having uh, features in the data here, you have values of the parameters. You have omega n, omega dark energy, w0, wa. And then each one of each row now is, uh, is, is, a, is a possible realization of the parameters that's consistent with the, uh, with the data. So we call that, that's a chain of samples. So Markov chain Monte Carlo is a way, it, it, it works entirely within the Bayesian framework and it allows you just to specify the likelihood and the prior and to then generate a, um, a set of, uh, of equally likely um, realizations of all of the, of all the parameters. So there's another method that's I think probably less, less well known, um, but equally valid. And it's generally a bit more work to, to set up, but then once you've done it, it can be more, uh, more efficient. And that other method is known as variational inference. Okay, and so these usually just go by acronyms, MCMC, for Markov chain Monte Carlo, and VI for variational inference. Um, and in variational inference, we take quite a different approach. Um, is, and that is we define uh, a family, uh, a functional family for the posterior. So the posterior, um, remember the posterior is the probability of the parameters given the data in the model. And so what we do is we, we come up with some, some analytic family, uh, functional family for that. So it's gonna be a function of the, the uh, it's, it's a function of the parameters, but it's parameterized in terms of some, uh, some degrees of freedom. So let me just make a sketch that kind of illustrates what I mean by that. So um, let's imagine kind of an abstract uh, function space, or actually it's a space of probability densities. So this is all possible probability densities. And so the true posterior is somewhere in this space because it is a probability density. Okay, that's that thing there. And then what we're doing is we're defining some family of possible uh, of probabilities. And so it's not gonna be all possible probability densities, but it's gonna be some restricted family. And the way that you move around in this, uh, in this space is by varying alpha. Okay, so alpha is multidimensional, but allows basically alpha is a set of knobs that you can turn to explore this space. And what is variational inference? So variational inference is, a, is a, kind of a systematic procedure for you, you, what you need to do is you consider some point in this space. Okay, so that, so the true, you have the true posterior and then you have some, uh, some point in this, in this uh, family of um, this approximating family. And then we need to find a, a distance between these two. So we need to define the distance for similarity between between two, not between two points in space, but between two 
uh, probability densities. Okay, so it's it's a way of so the imp, so this is like something that takes as input one probability density p and another probability density q, and then maps it to uh, to a real number that this measures a a distance. And there's different ways of doing this, but the one that's uh, most common is uh, is known as the uh, KL divergence. And um, so what you do then is you actually do an optimization. You allow alpha to vary and you find the point in the space that is closest. So you, you find the, the, the blue point in this space that is closest. And then that is going to be your approximation for the, uh, for the posterior. So that's called variational inference. Um, and of course, if you're lucky, then the true posterior will actually be if the true posterior happened to be inside here, then that's always going to give you the exact solution. You're going to, you'll, you will find it through that process. But in general, you work with a kind of a simplified, um, uh, a simplified family of, um, of posteriors, which are easy to work with. And so that's, that's how you're, you're working there. So as I said, so this is, you know, in cosmology, we use Markov chain Monte Carlo quite a lot. This other approach, variational inference, um, is often, um, more uh, more efficient, but it's a little harder to uh, to set up. Um, in in the the notebooks that I use for my um, my ten ten week course, I have uh, there's a there's a uh, actually two notebooks on Markov chain Monte Carlo and one on variational inference. So if you want to get more more details and have hands on examples for that, um, that that's uh, where we go next. Okay, so I'm going to uh, to stop sharing. I think so we're out of time. So I'm gonna to stop there um, and then ask if there are any questions. So waiting for uh, other questions. So I had one, uh, in fact, it does, does it, so just to know about the calculation of evidence, uh, do we know some machine learning methods very efficient to have this kind of evaluation? So for example, in a kind of random forest or neural network, do we have some tools to, to evaluate the evidence? Um, not really, because I mean, a random forest really doesn't, is not really constructed in a, in a Bayesian way. It really is kind of a frequentist uh, tool. So, um, I mean, there is actually some interesting uh, work, not so much in calculating the evidence, but um, so there's, uh, your so-called likelihood free inference techniques and effectively what they do is um, so likelihood free means that you don't actually know how to write down formulas or a piece of code for your likelihood but you do have a simulation so basically the you, you have a way of simulating your data um, and um, what you do then is you run the simulation many times and you actually basically just build up a joint probability matrix like we like when we looked at the, the the fifa soccer players so you actually kind of make a calculate probabilities in bins of of, of theory space and data space um, and then you can actually kind of just get an empirical uh estimate of the joint probability so that's kind of a clever approach um which you know really takes a different different viewpoint and it requires you know, often especially in particle physics we often have good simulations where we have no way of writing down likelihood so Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Oleg. Are nested samples categorized as a MCMC or has a kind of hybrid between MCMC and BI? Yeah, I would put them, so they're, they're not, it's, I mean, Markov chain Monte Carlo, so Markov means a very specific thing. So they're not actually, they don't satisfy the, you know, the, the definition of a Markov chain, but they're very much, they're very similar in flavor, you know, from a user's point of view, they're, they're almost, um, indistinguishable. I think, you know, the, the reason it's very useful to have those two tools is because they, they actually rely on very different um, kind of numerical uh, methods. So, you know, Markov chain is basically uses random numbers. Okay? It's, it's, it's fundamentally um, kind of a, Mark, a Monte Carlo random number uh, driven um, way of, of analyzing the problem. Whereas variational inference doesn't use any random numbers um, in kind of in the, in the, the plain the basic format. Instead, what it relies on uses optimization. Um, 
And, uh, and that, that's why I think variational inference probably deserves uh, more attention because optimization is something that's really improved a lot with modern machine learning. Like there's all these techniques like stochastic gradient descent and you, know, you, you can use packages like TensorFlow or PyTorch to do very sophisticated um, optimization. So there's kind of a trend now of people using those machine learning frameworks to do uh, to do variational inference, just because they're because they're so uh, um, uh, that they're very efficient at doing optimization problems. So. so, do we have other question? I have another question. Uh, yes. about uh, like the problem is the integral that is high dimensional and like scales quickly in complexity. Is yeah. there like any other stochastic integration methods that could also be used for solving that, that problem besides the Monte Carlo one? Well, I mean, as, as you probably know, if you want to, I mean, just, just for doing high dimensional integrals, then you know, if you have a one-dimensional integral, then you, you never want to use Monte Carlo. You're just going to slice it up and you know, you use either trapezoid rule or something, something fancier with weights and adaptiveness. Um, in two dimensions, you know, the same approach is still probably best. But once you get into 10 dimensions, if you're trying to do a 10-dimensional integral, it turns out that Monte Carlo is basically the best way of doing it. So um, uh, it, effectively, because what Markov chain Monte Carlo is doing is it's really doing an important sample, uh, important sampling um, uh, weighted Monte Carlo integral. So that's it's basically doing the, the evidence integral with, uh, with Monte Carlo. So I, I think it really is the most efficient um, way. Of course, if you only have one or two parameters, in your in your model, then then you could just you could just do a brute force numerical integration of the evidence, and you don't need to use these techniques. But in your know, most interesting problems, you you tend to have a lot of a lot more parameters than two. So, thanks. I, I have a question for people. Has, has anyone else ever looked at or used uh, this observable notebook that I was showing you? No, no. No, okay, yeah, so it's something that I just discovered probably about, about a year ago, um, and but now I use it in my research quite a lot. So I encourage you to take a look. Um, of course, it requires programming in JavaScript. Um, and so, but you know, JavaScript is actually uh, a, a pretty fun language to use. In some ways, it's similar to, to, uh, to Python, um, it's, it's, it's it runs really well in a browser. And of course, it's good. Uh, it's just good as a scientist to be aware of more, more programming languages. It gives you, um, um, it's, it's a very valuable skill on your resume too. So a lot of jobs need JavaScript programming. How do you discover it, David? Like in a conference and in a lecture or something like that? In the university? Uh, I don't know. I think it's from from trying to do visualizations in the in a web browser. So there's there's a kind of the the gold standard, like if like really really nice visualizations that you see in you know, New York Times and things like that. They they use this library, JavaScript library called D3. And after seeing a bunch of those, I figured I had to learn how to use that. Okay. Um, <laughs> and then it turns out the person that that used to work for the New York Times and created that visualization library then. Um, created this whole observable notebook framework. So kind of found a smart person and, and followed them. So. David, I have uh, one more question. Yeah. Uh, about the COVID example uh, that you did, uh, just to like make sure I'm getting it clear, like we compute the probability of someone uh, testing positive and negative in the test, like picking it at random from the population. Right, yeah. Okay, giving the priors, like the prior probabilities we get of how many people is infected in, in the region. Well, that, well that, that basically is the prior, so. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, so um, I'll just put that up again. So yeah, so we so the, these numbers here, so we said that in the general population, 2% are infected and 98% are not. So in, in this case here, I mean, that's something that's, that is really an empirical frequency probability that you could use. Um, but if you're, uh, you know, in, in more general Bayesian context, so you have to be more subjective in assigning those those probabilities, yeah. So, so this is if you don't know anything about, you haven't, you don't know any test results, and your your just your best guess for a random person off the street is that they have a two percent chance of being infected. Of course, I mean that's that's not the right number. It's the process that's important. Now. But it, but what is important is you have these numbers have to be in the absence of any information about the test. I have a last so question. Oh, so, wow. oh, sorry. Uh, no, no, no. Sure. I just like for complimenting, we could make like a more uh, fine tuning, like getting more information about the regions for a country, for example, like saying this region has a uh, distinct probability than the general population, like just starting with this prior and start making tests in people. So you could like get more information uh, starting with that prior. Yeah, yeah, for sure, right? So we could have more, you know, we, we, we could, for example, we could make this, um, we could have, you know, we could also add like asymptomatic as another option here, right? So they're, they're infected, but they're not showing any symptoms. We need to put a number there. Um, we could also, if we think there's a difference between um, uh, for men, men and women, we could, you know, split that up or by age. Yeah, so, you, you know, you can kind of, um, you can expand the, the, this, this, this matrix as much as, much as you want. Um, and, and that's totally valid. You're allowed to, you know, there's no rules about how you, you set up the problem. The only thing, you know, what, what statistics and probability tells you is once you set up the problem, there's only one way to you know, kind of combine the likelihoods and the priors to get the, your new information. And that's, that's what Bayes' rule tells you. So. When I, when I first learned that, I thought it was kind of surprising. I thought, oh, well, there's, you know, there's lots of different ways of doing this. And you know, really, I think I, I realized eventually that it's that you know, statistics is just the, 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 the axioms, the basic principles of statistics saying that once you set up the problem, there's only one way to combine, to combine these things. So. so just to understand pretty where the prior definitions, okay. So did you write, did you write this example after or before Jack Grealish on the, on the feed yesterday? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, just, just congrats because it's, 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 it's an historical uh, victory mm -hmm. and after the historical defeat of France. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so actually I'm not a big fan of Jack Grealish. I, my team is Liverpool and they- uh... Ah, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> they, really, they really embarrassed us last year. So. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> okay, thank you. David, okay. I, I was wondering if you can point to some examples in cosmology that use in for, um, variational inference because I, I cannot think of one. Oh yeah, okay. So there's actually a really nice example. There's there's a group at um, at Berkeley that they used variational inference to uh, basically estimate the um, the large-scale structure of the universe or so it's a very uh, ambitious uh, ambitious paper so they they use um, their their likelihood is basically comes from from uh, from running um, Gaussian uh, from generating Gaussian random fields and despite it's I'll, I'll uh, post the, the paper on the the Slack channel, but it's a kind of a kind of an amazing um, thing. So it's, it's conditioned the, the the data that they use is all of the Sloan imaging, or the, the Sloan observations, um, and yeah, the likelihood comes from uh, you know, Gaussian random field theory, um, and they're able basically to reconstruct the posterior they get is the for every location in the universe that Sloan observes. A probability density of uh, you know basically the delta field of the universe. So it's quite it's quite a uh, impressive. So and uh, yeah, at first you know I used to think the variational inference was just sort of a, a toy. It didn't have any practical examples, but I think um, 
that, that convinced me that it's, it's not. So if there are no questions, maybe uh, I, I think you haven't met many of the participants of the school. So I was wondering if uh, you will you would like to join the uh, the coffee break now at Wonder Me, or if you want to hang out here and get to know the participants, because I think they actually didn't introduce to you or anything, right? Yeah, no, I think I'd be happy to join the, the Wonder Me, but just to warn you, my Spanish is not very good. So. <laughs> But, but your French pronunciation of Liga was perfect. I was really, really